Okay, I guess we should get started. So, hello everyone. Apologies if you can't hear me over my parents' furnace, um, but I'll mute my microphone anyways, so it won't matter. Uh, so today we have Pascal visiting. He's Professor at University of Waterloo, and he's also a CIFAR AI Chair at the Vexter Institute. And uh, Pascal uh, notably got his master's from UBC, so he has a connection to us here. And uh, I would say he's one of the top RL researchers in Canada. Um, like very small number of RL researchers who've been as influential as him in the Canadian ecosystem. So uh, thank you, Pascal, and I'm looking forward to hearing the talk. Okay, well, thank you. So yeah, it's an honor for me to uh, be able to uh, talk like this. And uh, I remember uh, the good old days when I was at UBC. So I wish I could have come in person to uh, visit, but uh, I guess this is good for now. Okay, so... Um, all right, let me see if I can go to the next slide. There we go. Uh, so yeah, here's the outline for my talk. So uh, I guess I asked this question. So are we experiencing a technological singularity? And then to answer this question, so I'm gonna go over a bit of history about notions of superintelligence and, and also notions of singularity. Uh, but then in that process, uh, we'll talk about how machine learning is actually having quite uh, an important role in particular reinforcement learning. Um, so here at the end, I'll, I'll um, define the singularity as having something to do with uh, self-evolving systems. And, and then if, uh, if we believe that there's a singularity happening or about to happen, then an important question is what are the challenges or what is it that it's going to take to really uh, see this uh, singularity? And, and here, um, I'm going to argue that uh, there are several challenges. Uh, so I listed four on this slide. So gonna, I won't have time to go through all four of them, but I will go into more details about two of them. So uh, data efficiency and robustness. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the work uh, that my research group has been doing at Waterloo and Vector on self-supervised uh, learning. That's uh, to address data efficiency and also uh, synergistic machine learning with logic to address uh, robustness. Okay, so let's get started. Um, okay, so then um, if we go back to 1965, there was a mathematician, his name is Irvin John Good. Uh, so he wrote a very interesting paper. Uh, it was titled Speculations Concerning the First Ultra-Intelligent Machine. And in that paper, he essentially introduced what would be referred to today as a singularity. And he was essentially speculating about what artificial intelligence could do, and in particular, how it could trigger some runaway technological growth. So now what exactly does that mean? So now if we go forward a little bit, so in 2005, uh, Ray Kurzweil uh, also published a book where he said the singularity is near. And Ray Kurzweil um, was essentially talking about a bunch of things also related to technological growth. And he made the following observation. So in this graph, uh, we can see that as time passes by, so our progress in terms of technology keeps on accelerating. And what's common is that often we're at a certain point in time. We look in the past, there's a certain growth rate. We just predict the same growth rate. And usually this uh, prediction underestimates what really happens because with acceleration, then the growth rate should be even higher. And, and here, the reason why there's an acceleration is simply because when we develop some technology, we use this new technology to develop the next technology and so on. So by always leveraging the, the last technology that we develop, then we, we achieve this acceleration. Now, this is great, and we've been observing this. And, and then an interesting question is, are we going to accelerate forever? Or are we going to hit a wall? And at some point, all of this is going to stop. And, and basically, in his book, he's arguing that uh, no, this is not going to stop because when we're going to hit our own uh, human limitations, this is when we're going to see a merger of machine intelligence with, uh, I guess, human intelligence. And, and then so he's talking about symbiotic systems um, that essentially merge our, I guess, artificial intelligence with advances in, in biology. Okay, so um, now this was in 2005. And... Um, now today in 2020, um, and in fact for the last few years, we have seen 
uh, a lot of progress and machine learning has become uh, quite important for many advances. But uh, if we look at the field of, of computer science, historically what we, we used to do is to simply program a computer by specifying every single instruction that we need for a task. And, and then so okay, computers have led to a lot of advances with respect to different uh, technologies. But um, one limitation is that if you need to write down every instruction, then that means uh, as a programmer, you need to know the solution and you need to, to know it well enough to be able to spell it out. Mm -hmm. So what has happened since then is that with um, uh, machine learning, then we've developed a new paradigm where instead of specifying instructions, what we do is we provide examples to the machine and then the machine essentially figures out what are the right instructions for the task based on those examples. So this has completely changed uh, the field of natural language processing. So here's an example from machine translation. We have lots of examples, uh, lots of uh, data of um, pairs of sentences in two languages, and then um, the machine essentially learns uh, how to map from one language to the other. And this is something that linguists and computational linguists tried for a long time, but never managed to specify rules by hand. But now the computer uh, essentially learns to do this based on examples. Same thing in computer vision. Uh, so how do you uh, recognize objects or classify images? So for a long time in computer vision, people would uh, try to come up with all, uh, all sorts of heuristics and gradually uh, embrace machine learning where you simply feed examples. And that's now the state of the art for most things in, in computer vision. Okay, so uh, in this respect, uh, we could say that now there's a, a new, this new paradigm of machine learning uh, takes us at, at another level because we're, we're not limited by our ability to specify instructions for a solution. And, and now we can simply provide examples, right? So, so then um, we, we can accelerate in this fashion. But now if we apply this uh, to itself and, and so on, then we could arrive at a concept of self-evolution. And, and we're gradually, in fact, starting to see various types of computer systems that are evolving, that are adaptive. And, and here I'm going to suggest that perhaps this is uh, the form of singularity that we might be experiencing. Okay, so now let's have a closer look at machine learning. So we've got supervised learning uh, that works very well. And most of the industry has been embracing supervised learning where you have essentially some inputs, uh, there's some outputs. These uh, together forms uh, uh, pairs of, of data. And then we learn a predictor that maps the inputs to the outputs. Now, this predictor is static because all it does is simply map the inputs to the outputs. Um, now, if we look in contrast to reinforcement learning, um, so this is another part of, of machine learning. Well, uh, the system is not static in the sense that uh, it will select some actions. These are the outputs, they influence the environment then it receives uh, some observation and, and rewards. This is a form of feedback. And, and then the system will then change how it might uh, select the next actions and so on. So we've got a feedback loop and that leads to a system that can be uh, much more adaptive and, and can evolve over time. And we're seeing in various fields, uh, uh, the usage of, of reinforcement learning for that purpose. So for instance, in games, robotics, vehicles, operations research, networks, conversational agents, and also FinTech. So now let me illustrate a little bit uh, this notion of self-evolution and reinforcement learning uh, in various applications. So if we go back to AlphaGo that uh, DeepMind designed uh, a few years ago. Um, so the first version had a first phase of supervised learning where um, the machine was essentially learning to mimic what human experts for the game of Go would do in various situations. So there's a large database and it was just learning from that. But then if you want to play well and in fact beat the experts, right? You cannot just mimic what the experts do. You have to be able to come up with your own strategy and supervised learning will not allow you to surpass, I guess, the data set that you're learning from. So you need something else. And this is where reinforcement learning became key. The idea is that uh, the machine was then able to learn by self-play and develop its own strategy. 
And uh, we saw the effect of this in 2016. Uh, so there was a, a small tournament between AlphaGo and Lee Sidal, so five games. And in fact, in game number two, AlphaGo made a very interesting move. So this was move 37, where this stone was placed right here. And uh, this game, there were commentators. Uh, these were experts at the game of Go, both in English and in Korean. And then when they saw um, the stone uh, put at this location by AlphaGo, their reaction was like, this is a mistake. Nobody would ever do this. And, and everybody thought, okay, the machine just did a big boo-boo and, and it's probably gonna be over. But then you can see in this picture, Isidore is scratching his head. And, and the commentators also started thinking, what if this was not a mistake? What if this was a new type of move that nobody had thought about? And it turned out that indeed, this was an excellent move. And later on, uh, some analysis have shown that uh, this, uh, this move was in fact, uh, it gave a, a, an important advantage to uh, AlphaGo and AlphaGo won the game largely because of, of that move. So, so this was a really interesting case where we saw that reinforcement learning played an important role in terms of uh, developing its own strategy. And, and then DeepMind didn't stop there, so eventually developed Alpha Zero, where it was learning everything from scratch by self-play, no more supervised learning. Okay, so now uh, let's look at some uh, industrial applications as well. Um, so if we look at um, computer networks and telecommunication networks, so at the moment, uh, various um, telecommunication companies are, are deploying 5G mobile networks. And, and what does 5G really mean? So the target is to enable essentially uh, 20 gigabytes per second and also to enable the internet of things. So this is wonderful. Uh, so it means more capacity, more speed and, and, and so on. But if we keep going forward, so those companies are already thinking about 6G networks. And what are 6G networks? So in fact, what they're currently developing now our networks not so much with more capacity, but more intelligence. And, and what exactly is that? Uh, the idea is to have systems that are self-diagnosing, self-managing, self-evolving. And, and for them, it's now they're looking at the evolution from connectivity, that's normally just enabled by networking, to intelligence, where the idea is that you can use a lot of that connectivity and the data and so on to do more interesting things. And, and then in terms of achieving this, um, uh, various companies that, that are doing research are in fact exploring reinforcement learning for that. Um, also related to communication, so if we look at smartphones, there's a similar story where if you look at a smartphone and you think of the hardware or a smartphone you might wanna buy today, you often look at the battery life, the camera quality, the screen resolution, the size, et cetera, um, but then uh, future smartphones, um, various companies are trying to distinguish uh, their smartphones more with the application and also to make them uh, adaptive and personalized. So they're developing apps uh, that uh, are self-evolving and perhaps can adapt to users, not just by configuring them uh, at the beginning, but based on interactions with the user. And again, reinforcement learning is, is used for that. Let me give you one last example. So another industry, the financial industry is quite important in Canada. And um, here historically, um, there was no AI, no machine learning used. So uh, what is the financial industry doing? In a nutshell, the idea is that you've got some assets A, and then uh, you make a transaction and you move them to B. So uh, usually there's a decision maker who will decide when such a transaction can, can happen. Uh, but now if you look at current financial services, so machine learning is used quite a bit. In fact, a lot of supervised learning is used to come up with predictive models. So what has happened is that now we don't have just humans making decisions, but we have machines that are making prediction and, and informing the decision makers in, in that process. Uh, but going forward, in fact, several financial institutions are now starting to leverage reinforcement learning to develop some more personalized adaptive 
adaptive and self-evolving systems. Uh, so this is the case uh, for automated trading, but also when they develop new products, instead of having a single product that is uh, good for everyone in the market, the idea is that they can configure the product so they can adapt them based on, on your needs, based on, on your preferences. And, and then so in any case, uh, this, this is the next generation, this is starting um, and, and various uh, leaders are, are exploring that and they're tapping again into reinforcement learning to make this happen. Okay, so hopefully this gives you an idea of what I mean by self-evolving systems and, and what this uh, could uh, translate into going forward. But um, in terms of achieving a singularity, I would argue that there, there are some challenges. I mean, we're making great progress, the progress is fast and so on, but we have some challenges. So here uh, I've listed four. Um, there, there's more than that, but uh, I think these are four that are quite important. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to go into more details about two of them, data efficiency and also robustness. Um, now for data efficiency, there's lots of solutions that uh, the community is exploring. Um, so there's two shot learning, meta learning, transfer learning, multitask learning, and also self-supervised learning. So I'm going to talk about this last one in more detail, mostly because uh, with my group, uh, we made some contributions, but the others are also very important. And altogether, we're gradually uh, improving data efficiency. Um, the other important problem is robustness. So in that respect, um, there are issues where um, that can be addressed with adversarial training, also robust optimization. And then uh, I put a last one here that I call synergistic machine learning and logic, or if you prefer, this would be, um, I guess, a hybrid between symbolic AI and, and also machine learning. Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit about the work that some of my um, students and collaborators have done with respect to those challenges. So for the first one, data efficiency, uh, let's consider the problem of doing reinforcement learning from images. So here, if we just consider uh, some Atari game, then we might have uh, an image like this that is going to be fed into a neural network. This neural network is going to compute some actions or some Q values, and then it will receive some reward uh, and, and simply update based on that. Now, in this um, general framework of reinforcement learning, you see we've got this deep neural network uh, that computes these uh, actions and values, and then we use the rewards to train the network. Now, there is a challenge um, because in practice, we have typically neural networks with millions of parameters, but then the sparse reward means that either we get no reward most of the time, and then when we get some reward, it's really just one number. So if you have one number once in a while, right, and you have millions of powders, it will take a long time to train. And in, in fact, uh, existing algorithms tend to take millions of iterations to train because they have so many powders. So in that respect, um, one approach to circumvent this uh, data efficiency or to improve the data efficiency is to do self-supervised learning, which means that um, we're going to create some auxiliary targets and that provide more information and, and, and learn from that. So one obvious thing to do is that instead of uh, simply maximize the rewards, we could also look at what if we have an image and then a network that predicts the next image. And the idea is that if you can predict what will happen in the future, you should be able to uh, select also good actions because you will know how, what the, what's the effect of your actions. So, so then it's, it's a good auxiliary task. And the benefit is that in the case of images, if you can predict all the pixels of the next image, there's like millions of pixels in each image. So that's a lot of information. And, and then you can learn a lot more quickly from that because it's a dense signal. Okay, so uh, I guess how supervised learning, uh, we're gonna see in a moment how, how to do this, but uh, that won't be the only issue. Uh, another important distinction between what machines do and what humans do is how they interpret the data. So when you look at a game, so this is a game of Sequest, right? Uh, if you've never seen this game, it doesn't matter. You can probably guess that there's a little submarine that's your agent that's shooting uh, some enemies. These are the swimmers that are passing by. And you can interpret most of what is on, on that, uh, uh, in, in, in this video. 
But in contrast, if you're a machine, what you really see is, is just a bunch of pixels, right? So pixel intensities, and, and then you don't have a way of interpreting this immediately. So, so as a result, reinforcement learning agents, then they have to spend a lot of time to interpret those um, uh, pixels, whereas humans, they can work directly with what they see and interpret, for instance, the moving objects. So here, um, what I'm going to argue is that in this deep neural network that typically works directly on images, there's, there's a bottom part that essentially does the feature extraction. And this is great because we're not doing this manually, but still it means that the machine is going to spend a lot of time and, and require a lot of the data to essentially just figure out how to interpret uh, those pixel intensities. And then the real goal in reinforcement learning is to do policy optimization to select actions. So there's a part of the network that does that, but that's actually not a big part of it. And, and it really has to wait for the feature extraction part to be done properly uh, in order to, to, to then eventually select good actions. So that, that explains also why it, it can take a really long time for those algorithms uh, to converge. Okay, so, so then the question is, can we design some uh, techniques that would allow agents to learn, let's say, to segment moving objects? Because if humans are thinking at the level of objects, and in the case of games, usually the moving objects are the ones that matter, right? So could we get an agent to do this automatically, feed that after that to the reinforcement learning part, and, and then obtain a policy faster? Okay, so if we look at computer vision, there's been a lot of work in terms of segmentation. And in fact, we can do segmentation in an unsupervised fashion by leveraging uh, things like optical flow and, and doing, generally speaking, what is known as structure for motion. So here uh, I've got an example where there's a cyclist or some pedestrians, they're moving. Uh, you can measure the optical flow. And you, you notice that the optical flow for uh, all the pixels that are part of the same objects tend to be more or less the same. So that gives you a hint that this must be an object. And then same thing for the pedestrians. So anything that's moving, then you can, you can already um, guess that, that the, this must be a moving object. So, so there have been several proposals. Um, so in our work, we considered one from Google that was called Structure from Motion Network. Um, and, and then the idea is that you can train this network to automatically recognize, uh, that means segment out the moving objects and also identify their motion. And then we're going to feed that to a reinforcement learning agent to speed things up. So, so here I've got a version of this network that's been simplified to just work in 2D. Uh, so we take as input some images. We've got some convolutional layers. There's uh, an embedding. From this, we're going to compute some object masks. This is going to effectively give us the segmentation. We're also going to compute the translation or the motion that each object follows, as well as the camera. And then when we combine these things together, we can get the optical flow. And now the beauty is that if we have, let's say, uh, one image, and then the optical flow, and we add that, we can get a reconstruction of the second image and then compare that to, to the ground through second image and back propagate all the way through. So, so this is a case where you see it's self-supervised because nobody has to label anything. Uh, we simply leverage the fact that we've got a sequence of images and we can always take uh, two images, feed them in, reconstruct the second image and, and back propagate. So that's exactly what we did. And just to illustrate, you see our input consists of two frames, two consecutive frames. Uh, so this is for the game of breakout. And here we've got the game of Pong. Then um, the, uh, the network uh, here extracts some object masks. So, so these are essentially just um, uh, variables that indicate with value zero or one, whether a pixel is part of an object or not. So we can see here in, in green where it thinks that the objects are. So like in the game of, of breakout, we've got a paddle that moves here and then there's the ball up here. So it recognizes them. And then we've got the optical flow, which indicates uh, the, the, the motion of each object. And here it's color coded. So green and red essentially means different uh, directions. Okay, so so we use that to essentially extract in an unsupervised fashion or self-supervised fashion the object mask and, and their motion. 
and then we can feed that to a reinforcement learning agent and we we call that motion oriented reinforcement learning so so we've got uh, the top part of our network here that is what i described earlier so this computes optical flow and then um, we take a middle layer that's the embedding that captures all the information about the segmentation and also the um, uh, the, the motion and, and then feed that to a bottom part. The bottom part is just a regular actor critique type network where normally you see we would just do some convolutions and then eventually feed that to an, an actor network and a critique network. So this is the reinforcement learning part. So you see the bottom part just works with raw pixel. The top part computes object locations and also the, uh, the motion. And then we combine the same the low and the high level information together right here. And then the claim is that this will accelerate uh, the, um, the learning. So in fact, when we did that, um, if we use, let's say for the bottom part, A2C, then by combining uh, and comparing to just plain A2C, on the 59 games from Atari, we obtained uh, good policies faster for 26 games. It was similar for 30 games and worse for three games. And if instead we use PPO, then uh, it got faster for 25 games, similar for 25 and worse for nine games. Okay, so just to illustrate, I've got some videos here that show um, what happened. So uh, on the left, we have uh, the original view. On the right, it's uh, the uh, real-time segmentation that the network computes. You'll notice that the segmentation is far from perfect, but here in any case, the, the, the goal is not to do segmentation for the sake of segmentation is just to get some high level information we can feed to a reinforcement learning agent. And, and you see, uh, even if the quality is not perfect, it's good enough to provide high level information that, that uh, can speed up uh, the, the learning. So it works well on Pong, on Breakout, on Sequest. I've included an example here where it's, uh, it's not helping. In fact, in this game, you'll notice that we have some some beams. These are the, uh, the, those blue bars that are just falling down, and they're just visual artifacts. They don't matter at all in the game. And and here we have this assumption that we're going to segment everything that's moving. So so that's exactly what our network does. The problem is that then it's feeding high level information that is irrelevant, and then and then it 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 just doesn't help. So, so this is an example of a case where essentially our, our method did not help and, and perhaps even harm a little bit because it's feeding in some, uh, some irrelevant information. Okay, so um, to summarize this in terms of results, uh, so for those four games, we have here the reward, so higher is better, and then we've got uh, time steps. So we want to achieve a good policy as fast as possible. And we can see in yellow, this is our approach. And then the other colors are essentially other baselines that, that we compare to. So we can see that for the first three games, uh, we managed to accelerate the learning. And then on Beam Rider, uh, again, we were feeding in some information that was irrelevant and then we, we are not improving at all, okay? Um, so, now, if you're interested, um, you can go to our, my website and then we've got results like this for all 59 games. You can watch videos as well as the curves like this for all 59 games, but at least this gives you an idea on, on four games. Okay, so, so we did this in the context of images, but now you might say, well, I don't care about images. I, I care about text instead. Can we do the same thing with text? So, so this year at NeurIPS, we just got a paper accepted and um, uh, you guys are lucky. Uh, I'm talking about this before NeurIPS even happens. So, uh, so I'm gonna give you a, a, a preview essentially of, of this work. Um, okay, so uh, it turns out that in the same way that we have all kinds of video games, they're also text-based games. They might not be as popular, but there are in fact quite a few on the web. So I've listed uh, some of those that are popular. And recently Microsoft also developed a text-based games specifically to test reinforcement learning algorithms. And, and then in this game, the goal is essentially that um, you have a quest. The quest consists of gathering some ingredients and then to cook a recipe. And the idea is that in a text-based game, you receive from the game engine a description of your environment in text, and then you select an action. Uh, so, so that's a text command again, uh, go west, and then 
uh, after going west, so in this case, you see the agent was uh, in, in, in some room, then it enters a shed, and then it will observe new things. So I guess there's, there's another textual description, and, and the game just keeps going like this, where uh, every time you send a command, you receive a textual description, and, and that's what you need to work with. Okay, so um, the, the, I, I, I guess a common architecture for this would be to process the text, uh, to have some, some representation for the text and then to select actions based on that. And what I'm gonna show you is that similar to what we've done for, um, for image reinforcement learning, so here with text, um, an interesting representation for text would be knowledge graph. So I'm, I'm gonna show you how we can do self-supervised learning to obtain some knowledge graph that essentially capture uh, some representation of the text. And it turns out that for text world, the game engine is in fact designed in a way where internally it does use knowledge graph to represent states and also observation sequences. So here I, I simply displayed three examples of, of such knowledge graphs. So um, when you start uh, the game um, in, in some settings, you might have a knowledge graph like this where every node corresponds to a, an entity. So that's uh, either an object, a location or a property. And then every edge is a relation between those entities. So for instance, here we have that there's a corridor and then there's an exit that is south of the corridor, okay? Um, and, and then uh, after one action, uh, so let's say that the action is go east, then uh, the agent moves a little bit and then gets to observe new things. So now the knowledge graph becomes a little bit uh, um, because it can observe a larger part of, of the state, okay? So, so, so this is the internal representation in text world. And then this will keep on going as, as you play the game. Or really just... Our work, we're not using them, okay? So uh, those not learn or rediscover or estimate those knowledge graphs from the text. Okay, so how did we do this? In our approach, so um, here you see we feed the text to a box, this green box, which is really a graph updater. So this graph updater is going to compute or estimate a knowledge graph from the text. So it takes um, the, some, some observation, which is a text. It takes a comment, an action, which is again some text. It will encode that. It takes also encodes that. It and it will compute a new graph here. There's a green box that does the graph updating. Um, and then for action selection, this is uh, the reinforcement learning part. Um, so we have again uh, an observation or the text that is fed in. There's also the graph, which is the belief of the agent that is fed in. So there's a text encoder, there's a graph encoder that gets merged together. And, and then in terms of selecting actions, uh, so the actions are, are sequences of words, right? These are commands. So he, here, uh, the space of possible commands um, will be encoded with a text encoder, and then we'll simply select an action by scoring every possible uh, text command and, and select the best one. Okay, so, so this is uh, the overall architecture, but now how do we um, construct an Are we using So we have uh, an observation, which is a text that's fed into the graph updater. And then at the end, we're gonna reconstruct the text. And the idea is that we can think of the graph as colder, and then it just uses a structured representation in the middle in a form of a graph for, for that. So, so here, yeah, we have the text encoder, the graph encoder, and then at the end, uh, once we have the graph, then we use it to
there we, we can learn to present that information from the text. Um, okay, the second approach, uh, instead of trying to regenerate the text, um, a lot of people sometimes are a little bit uh, concerned that maybe the text uh, contains a syntactic information that's not so important and there's a lot of a chit chat as well that's not so important. Uh, so we could use instead a, a form of contrastive classification where the idea is that you have again the graph of data, uh, the graph gets encoded, the text as well, and now instead of regenerating the text, we will compare the, the ground truth text with some other text that comes from some other observation. So OT is a ground truth text. OT with uh, distilled is, um, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, a, a, a different observation, a different time step that is wrong. In a and you determine one and, and it means to essentially recognize that, that this is the correct text. Um, so, so then it's a classification problem as opposed to a text generation problem. But if, it, if you can succeed in doing this, then presumably you've uh, understood what the text is about. Um, so yeah, so we tried these, these two techniques and, and in fact, they, they worked quite well. So, okay, uh, without going into more details, uh, some of the results here, um, we, we tried uh, these techniques by training on on 20 games and also on 100 games. And here, um, we're, we're not training and testing on the same game. So we're training on some games and then we're testing on, on some other games that come from, from the game engine. Okay, so it's a little bit different from most reinforcement learning where you typically train on a game and, and test on that same game after that. So here we're, we're testing on, on different games. Meta is, is our approach. So that's a graph updated, the graph updated, uh, at some uh, traditional uh, baselines. So TRDQN, that's uh, a deep tune network that uses a transformer to process the text. And, and now because it's partially observable, we can also have a deep recurrent Q network to deal with the partial observability and, and also still um, a, a transformer. Um, and, and yeah, so these are the baselines. Um, so perhaps this comes the most important one to look at. So we're looking at how much improvement there is on the simplest type of agent, which would be a DQN, a DQ network with a transformer. Uh, so we can see that making it recurrent improves a little bit, uh, but then when we get to our agents, so our approach here is GATA. So I've got here four, diff four variants, uh, but um, without going into the details, uh, these correspond to the type of uh, self-supervised learning that we use and also um, the, the type of inputs that we feed it with. Um, and, and then in any case, they, they all perform quite well. Uh, and here we also have some upper bounds. Instead of, um, if we wanna see how good this is, uh, we could compare to what if the agent had access to the ground truth graph. So, so these uh, results are, the, are agents that essentially have access to the ground truth graph. So the best agent for that has an improvement of 81.6. So there's still an important gap. So there's a lot more that, that we can do. But in any case, it's already a nice improvement compared to uh, a, a traditional baseline. Okay, so this concludes uh, the first part on, on data efficiency. And um, okay, I've got uh, perhaps another 15 minutes where what I'll do is now talk about uh, the second topic, robustness. So, so this is a, a very important topic as well, because as you've uh, probably seen in, in many previous talks, um, often we have networks or classifiers or predictors that can be fooled simply by uh, applying some small perturbation. So here we just add some noise, the image really doesn't change at least at the human eye, and yet the classification changes tremendously. So, so this is a form of um, uh, brittleness that we would like to, uh, to address. Uh, but another aspect that is important that uh, often falls under robustness is the problem of local optima. So uh, in most techniques for machine learning, there's a form of optimization and we're trying to find parameters that are best uh, for a task. And, and now if the landscape that we're optimizing uh, is non-convex, then we're gonna have some local optima. And ideally we'd like to find the best setting. So this would be the global optimum, but chances are we might get stuck uh, into a different valley that is not optimal. And, and how, how bad is this valley? 
uh, that that might be uh, that might vary quite a bit. Okay, so so then that means that our algorithms um, might not find the, the best solution, and and then we we don't have a clue about why why that is happening, other than the fact that it's it's really stuck into a local optimum. Okay, so here um, I'm going to argue that there are ways um, to get around this. Um, in fact, by combining uh, sim symbolic forms of AI with machine learning. Okay, so let's have a look at um, uh, an important problem. So Boolean satisfiability. So it's an, an, an NP-complete problem. And, and then when you formulate it as an optimization problem, it will have a lot of local optima. And, and therefore, agents are going to get stuck easily as well. Okay, so um, briefly, so Boolean satisfiability. The problem is that we want to find an assignment of Boolean variables that satisfy a set of clauses. As an example, I might have variables v1 through v5. Uh, here I've got three clauses, so v1 or v2. We also have a clause two that's a not v1 or not v2 or v3 and so on. And here's a solution that satisfies those three clauses. So you can set v1 to true, v2 to false, etc. And the problem here is that we'd like to find a satisfying assignment if possible. And if that's not possible, we'd like to return that uh, this is uh, unsatisfiable. Okay, so what are the techniques for uh, solving these types of problems? So modern SAT solvers are uh, usually based on what are known as conflict-driven clause learning. Uh, so the idea is that um, these uh, solvers can be summarized in, in one picture here, where you have a SAT instance, and then you're going to gradually uh, build a search tree by essentially instantiating some variables uh, so here that means variable x could be instantiated to true, then variable u could be instantiated to true, and, and so on. Okay, so you essentially gradually instantiate variables, and then if you uh, find a conflict, then um, you would do certain things, and if there's no conflict, you would do some other things. And the idea is that um, at the end, when we find that there's a, a conflict at the end of a branch, uh, that we cannot satisfy the, the clauses, then we need to undo some of our assignments. So we're going we're gonna to back jump. And at the same time, we can learn a new clause. So that's where the, the, the name uh, conflict-driven clause learning comes from, is that each time you find a conflict, then you will uh, essentially add a clause to your set. And that's a form of, of learning. Uh, also, in, in the process of building the search tree, there's an important decision that needs to be made at every node, which is essentially which, which variable to branch on. So for instance, if we start with x, we assign false, then we go with y, we assign false, then we might ask, what's the next variable that I should try to assign a value to? And, and choosing that next variable is, is very important. It will influence tremendously the time it takes to, uh, to, to solve this problem. So yeah, so this is the, the branching problem here. Okay, so it turns out that we can view this branching problem as a machine learning problem in the sense that uh, historically, practitioners would come up with heuristics and then they would fine tune them and so on. But you might as well have a heuristic that is data driven, that is essentially informed based on um, some experience and, and, and optimized based on, on machine learning. So it turns out that we can formulate branching as a multi-arm bandit, which is really a special case of, of reinforcement learning. So here we have actions that are the variables. So we're trying to decide which uh, variable to branch on. And then we have rewards that are going to be the learning rate. So here that means effectively the ratio of the number of learned clauses that involve that variable divided by the number of learned clauses in, in total. So essentially you see, in clause-driven learning, right, we want to find conflicts, add new clauses, and the more we add, the, f the faster we're, we're, we're going to uh, uh, solve this problem. And, and therefore, we'd like to branch on variables that are going to lead to conflicts as fast as possible. That's, that's what it means. So, so then uh, we propose uh, a heuristic, LRB. Uh, so that's a learning rate branching heuristic that essentially selects a variable with the highest exponential moving average so far, okay? So when we tried this um, back in 2016, 
Uh, we tested that on the 2014 benchmarks. And um, here we are looking at a cactus plot. So essentially, we would like a curve that is as much as possible to the right side, uh, because that corresponds to solving uh, more instances in less time, right? So you want a curve that is to the right and as low as possible. So our approach LRB is this one. And then we've got some of the previous approaches that uh, practitioners were, were using before that. And then we entered the SAT 2016 competition. Uh, we won a, a first place uh, gold medal, and then in 2017, a, a silver medal. So, so this um, heuristic ended up uh, making uh, an, an important difference and, and, and was quite successful. Um, okay, so we, now we don't have to uh, just look at the branching part. Uh, in fact, a lot of people have now started to look at SAT in its in entirety and can we formulate SAT completely as a machine learning problem. So for this, there's in fact a, a literature on, on combining uh, graph convolutional neural techniques with SAT. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this. Instead, of, let me tell you about a different way of viewing it from the perspective of Bayesian learning. So it's a little bit more traditional, but it's going to be quite effective. In fact, it's a lot lighter than graph convolutional neural networks. And we're gonna see that we can improve the state of the art and uh, obtain some, some pretty nice results. So here, if we wanna formulate this as a learning problem, we can say, let's consider a bunch of variables, so v1, v2, v3, that are part of some clauses. And, and then for each variable, we need to do decide how to assign a value, right? So we don't know what value to assign, so let's use a variable theta that will indicate the probability that we assign true to that variable. So every variable is gonna have a, a corresponding theta, and then every clause is going to have a Boolean variable here that will indicate whether we satisfy that clause or not. And from a machine learning perspective, we can think of the clauses as like data. Each time you get a clause, it's uh, like a data point and you can measure the likelihood of that clause being satisfied based on different values of, of the variable. So this is the formula for, for the likelihood function. Now, once we've got a likelihood function, um, we can do Bayesian learning. So we can start with a prior over those uh, theta variables. Then we multiply by the likelihood and then we'll get a posterior distribution and the posterior distribution can be used to effectively uh, learn how to uh, assign values to each variable. Now, the beauty of Bayesian learning is that if you do that exactly, you will effectively solve the SAT problem, but naturally because it's NP hard, um, you can expect some uh, computational intractability. And indeed, if you do exact Bayesian learning, you'll end up with a posterior that consists of ex an exponentially large mixture of beta products. So it's going to be uh, intractable because of this exponential explosion here. So, so then um, we decided to look at some ways of approximating Bayesian learning. And uh, we uh, sell down on, on a technique known as Bayesian moment matching that essentially does the following. So let's say we've got a, a distribution that consists of a single beta product. And after we do Bayesian learning, so an exact Bayesian update with one clause, then we end up with a posterior that grows in size. So gradually it will become exponential, but at every step it just grows a little bit. So we get a mixture of beta products. So, so before it becomes exponentially large, what we can do is just project it down to a single beta product. And when we project, we can do this by matching the moments. So here by moments, I simply mean that we've got a distribution. We're going to approximate it by matching, for instance, the mean and the variance. Okay, so the mean and the variance are the first and second order moments of, of the distribution. So if you do this repeatedly, then you obtain an algorithm that is approximate, but is tractable. So here, if we compare, you see exact Bayesian learning would be optimal, would solve the SAT problem uh, exactly, but it's not tractable. Bayesian moment matching, is an approximation, so it's not going to be optimal, but on, on the other hand, it's, it's tractable. So now the question is, is there a way to combine the two so that we can get an improvement, something that perhaps is a little more tractable and at the same time, a little more optimal 
than, than the current approximations. And the answer is to essentially combine uh, CDCL solvers with an initialization that is performed by Bayesian moment matching. So Bayesian moment matching is tractable. In fact, it's, it's quite fast. It's very, very simple to code, very fast. And what we've observed is that we can satisfy like 99% of the clauses in less than a second for large um, benchmarks that might have millions of, of variables. And um, then after we satisfy 99% of the clauses, then uh, we can propose that as an initialization to the CDCL solver, who can just take it from there and, and then um, essentially uh, find a satisfying assignment or otherwise prove that it's unsatisfiable. So when we did that, then um, we um, compared the approach on some hard cryptographic benchmarks, as well as uh, uh, the benchmarks on the SAT 2018 competition. And you can see that our approach was improving a lot of the existing algorithm. So our approach can be combined with uh, any existing algorithm because it's just an initialization technique. And then we let the SAT solver essentially optimize from that point on. Okay. So, um, so then, yeah, you can see that uh, like MapleSat, there's a BMM version. So that's with our Bayesian moment matching uh, uh, improvement. And you see uh, the green curve is lower than, than um, the purple curve. So that was an improvement. And, and then glucose, that's the blue curve. And then there's the orange curve. So that's better as well. Crypto mini sat, that's the yellow curve. And then the blue curve is with the BMM initialization and that's lower. So it's better as well. So in general, you see, we're able to improve uh, uh, most of the solvers in, in this way. And, and so this was a, a nice combination. Okay. So, um, I'm, I'm going to stop talking at this point. So uh, I've uh, essentially walked you through uh, some high level ideas at the beginning regarding the singularity where what I'm suggesting is that perhaps uh, this can be achieved via self-evolving systems. Uh, but then in, in towards this, there's a lot of challenges. We talked mostly about two of them. If you're interested about uh, the work that I just presented, these are the papers that I've essentially summarized in, in this presentation. Um, obviously, there's a lot more than, than just this work, uh, but hopefully this gives you a, a bit of a taste. And, and now coming back to the question of, are we experiencing um, a singularity? So I, I really don't know, but there's one thing that is certain for sure. So gradually, we're seeing that there's more adaptive and autonomous systems that are being deployed. And, and then so evolution or self-evolving system is gradually becoming a reality. Okay, so yeah, let me... Let me stop here and then I'll be happy to take some questions. All right, let's, let's virtually thank Pascal for the interesting talk. Um, and then I, we, have, we are at about 3.55 or 2.55 where you are. Um, and so if you have to go now uh, for something at three o'clock, then feel free to go now. But otherwise, uh, let's just open the floor and feel free to either yell out or type into the chat and we can relay the uh, questions. Awkward pause time before someone <laughs> brave enough and okay, Michael, go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for the uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, some of the the methods that you spoke about uh, ultimately have some some fairly specific components that that relate to the type of problem that's being solved. And so I was wondering to what extent you, you actually think, um, you know, calling something an MDP and a POMDP and, and saying we're going to use reinforcement learning to, to solve it. To, to, to what extent does, does that actually provide, it, you know, a, a, any practically useful information uh, just because the, the sets of of features and algorithms and uh, just all the details to actually make it work tend to be completely uh, different depending on whether you know your problem has a vision-based input or um, or you're solving a SAT problem or you're you're solving a bandit problem or you're solving continuous control problems and so uh, yeah I, I guess it's the broader question about about you know uh, transferability 
of uh, RL algorithms be between different between completely different domains, and and that that kind of the you know is is RL being oversold uh, as a, as a you know R, RL are RL algorithms being oversold in terms of their generality? Because to, to really get them to work, you, you need to know a lot to to get anywhere near the state of the art on on any particular problem. Yeah. Okay. So that's a great question. So indeed, um, yeah. If if we argue that uh, something is general and it can solve a lot of problems, then obviously there's got to be some part of it that is still tailored to each problem. And and then so here in in um, the examples that I gave, like for image based RL and text based RL, there's usually some encoder. Uh, that takes care of that, and I did not go into the details of that. Uh, but I guess for image-based RL, there's a, there's a convolutional neural network uh, that that can be used for for that, and then for text-based RL, we would we would use a transformer instead, right? So so then the idea is that um, usually the inputs, uh, no matter what, we're going to use some sort of uh, uh, deep neural network that will essentially extract some features, and then will and then uh, once the features are, are in a format that uh, uh, is reasonable, then then some RL technique can can be used af after that. Uh, but then I, I guess um, like OpenAI has also done a, a good job in terms of uh, publishing some some libraries uh, that now have been uh, pretty much copied by uh, Google and and Facebook and, and PyTorch and, and TensorFlow. And, and then so uh, there's some important baselines like PPOA2C and several others that, that are available widely. And um, I've had the chance to uh, work with various companies that are in fact using those, uh, those libraries. So those libraries, you know, they're, they're domain agnostic, right? Uh, and again, usually they would uh, combine with them some, uh, some form of encoder um, to uh, process the, the data. And 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 then it, it works. Uh, so so I guess uh, there's been there's been uh, a lot of advances, and RL is not what it used to be in the sense that uh, there are some some important successes now and applications in in the industry. And um, uh, but obviously it's still not at the same level as the rest of of machine learning that is literally used everywhere. Yeah, but but some. Michael's frozen, I guess. So, so maybe, <laughs> well, we can wait for him to follow up. And um, there's a question from the chat, uh, basically saying, uh, the conscious mind does not think about pixels or edges, but concepts and objects instead. Um, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that statement, but the question is, can the algorithms work on this level too and include a notion of causality as well? Um, okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. I see, so I see the, the, the mind yeah, thinks in terms, terms of edges, edges. Uh, or not in terms of pixels and edges, but concepts and objects. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, so, so that that's what I was arguing, I guess, with uh, the first part of of the talk, where I um, I essentially extracted from pixels objects, and and then so we we have. Uh, uh, an object-based representation of the images, and then same thing for uh, for the text, right? So instead of just thinking at the character level, right? So we we extract essentially a, a knowledge graph. So these these are entities and and relations, and and then so there is clear benefit. This is what we've been demonstrating in in our work that if you essentially bring the information at this high level, the same high level that humans uh, essentially process information at then reinforcement learning techniques can work faster, can work better. So, so definitely. Uh, okay, I guess, I guess the second part of the question is asking, can the algorithms work on this level? So I said yes, and then include the notion of causality as well. Yes, okay, so causality is an important other question. I'm uh, less well-versed in, in, into this. Um, so, so, so here, um, I, I guess uh, often the question of causality arises when you've got data that's been observed and, and you just don't know what variable might be causing what variable and what you, you've observed. But if on the other hand, you observe data with time steps, um, then often you can just use time to order these things in a way where you know that 
uh, a variable cannot have influenced anything that came before. So in reinforcement learning, um, because everything is time stamped, uh, time stamped um, then there's fewer questions regarding causality, but still uh, there are interesting questions. Uh, so in fact, I'm, I'm doing some work with a company called Sport Logic, where um, we're looking at uh, uh, hockey games uh, and, and generally speaking, uh, various uh, games from different sports. And uh, now we ask questions like, okay, should, uh, could a, a player have uh, uh, done something different that would have changed the course of the game as in, you know, not uh, being scored by the other team, right? And, and now it's unclear in the previous actions, right? So uh, what, what might have, uh, if, if you change one action, then what would have happened to the rest? So I guess there, there's some important questions of causality that arise. Um, and, and I guess um, causality has been something that uh, the community has uh, studied a lot in the context of uh, probability statistics inference. Now in machine learning, it's, it's becoming a hot topic. Uh, so a lot of people are starting to look into this, but I feel it's still uh, something uh, that's quite young in a sense. I'd also like to make a small comment on the issue of causality here. So you sort of hinted at um, these models are causal in the sense that you, you have the past affecting the future, like this Granger causality type of thing. But a stronger notion of causality is whether you can predict the effects of your actions. And reinforcement learning is all about that. So I would argue that reinforcement learning models are basically always causal. You're trying to predict how your actions affect the world. They don't necessarily give causal explanations of how the world works, so they're not addressing causality in that sense, but I would say reinforcement learning models are actually always causal. Okay, very good. <laughs> okay, Seymour, did you want to ask a question? Um, yes. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks Pascal for the very nice talk. So I have a question regarding the application of uh, reinforcement learning in finance. Mm -hmm. So um, I know some startups who are trying to um, guess the stock market by trying to make uh, buy and sell decisions for day trading. Mm -hmm. So I just want to pick your mind on what do you think, like how far reinforcement learning has gone? Um, do you think that such an application is possible because uh, the data is so less and for reinforcement learning to really, uh, you know, beat the human baseline, it has to be really data efficient. And also uh, it must extract as much juice as possible from the data. And also it has to handle from uh, the noise of the market. Yes. So do you yes. think like, doing such a thing is useful? Well, okay, there's useful and profitable, okay? <laughs> and I can say it's profitable. So I know some companies that are making a lot of money using reinforcement learning for automated trading. So that is a reality. And that's what uh, the, the field is moving towards. Uh, so historically, um, there were traders that um, used to essentially do trades by hand. Uh, many years ago, they started to do automated trading, but without uh, machine learning techniques. So they essentially had lots of uh, handcrafted rules that they would uh, gradually update on, on a daily basis. Um, and, and it was really like um, a lot of uh, grunt work in, in terms of manually updating these things without having uh, a clear sense of uh, whether they would work well or not. And, and now many firms have started to use reinforcement learning uh, to essentially do this uh, updates of the rules automatically. And, and in fact, I mean, when I say updates of the rules, it, it's, it's, it's really just reinforcement learning. Uh, so, so yeah, various firms are using reinforcement learning. And, and in terms of the data, um, so here it depends at what frequency you're looking at. So if you're doing high frequency trading, there's no problem. There's plenty of data. If you're doing trading at the day level, then you have a problem, right? So there's not that much data uh, because it's 365 days. And, 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 you know, if you just look at a period of 10 years, that's not a lot of data uh, for reinforcement learning. But if you're doing high frequency trading, uh, then there's plenty of data. Okay, I just have one follow-up question. I was wondering why the academic uh, community does not pick up this data and, you know, why don't we have papers on this field? <laughs> well, uh, the answer is that I, I guess if, let's say you succeed in applying reinforcement learning and making money, 
why would you publish a paper, right? You're just gonna go make money and you don't have to tell anyone that's better than publishing a paper, right? So, so the finance industry, uh, generally speaking, does not publish its successes. Uh, so in fact, when you read about a paper that uses uh, some machine learning technique in finance, you should always ask yourself what's wrong with it because if it was really working, um, and it was really outstanding, they just wouldn't publish it. Same thing is true of like spam filters and a bunch of other domains. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess here, what I can say too is that um, sometimes from the outside, or I guess if you're just in academia, you look at a lot of papers uh, that are published, let's say on, on video games or text-based games, and you might think, oh, these are just games, who cares? And uh, you know, it should be a, a real application. But the reality is that if you look at papers that have co-authors from a company, chances are they actually have a real application, but they don't have permission to publish anything about that real application. So what do they do? They publish it uh, by showing essentially the algorithm on a video game because, you know, the liars won't see a problem with that. So, so there's a lot of work from companies Companies that gets published on, on what is considered toy domains or, or domains that, that are just not commercial. And, and that's essentially their way out to, to do the publications. So, so I guess, um, yeah, the, the idea is that there, there are plenty of, of uh, industrial applications, but then again, um, you know, if, if, it's, uh, if you're gonna give your secrets away to the competition, that's, that's not good. So, so, so you, you, you publish, but in, in a different way. Yeah, you, you can Google uh, Volion. I don't, I don't know if they use RL specifically, but it's a bunch of ML and optimization profs running a hedge fund and they're just making money hand over fists. I think they have the highest starting salaries of any company you can go work for. Okay, okay are there other questions, comments? All right, if nobody's gonna jump in, I'm gonna ask you about SAT actually. So um, what I'm worried about is the really hard SAT instances, the ones that only have that one thing that you can't easily get to by like greedy methods. Do you think your methods will sort of solve these types of instances or are they more for like the, a more typical case? Um, well, so, okay, here, uh, the results that I showed, let me go back. Um, yeah, they were, um, so we, we did it for hard cryptographic benchmarks and also the SAT 2018 benchmark. So that includes, I guess, what you could consider like as a common, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, difficulty, but also hard difficulty. So, so here, um, I, I'm not the one who did the experiment, so I can't say precisely about the most difficult ones in here. How did it do? But uh, on the other hand, you can see that for all the, um, the algorithms, right, those, those curves, when they go up, it means that uh, the, they're solving some instances, you know, with time that just starts growing exponentially, right? So, so they're having a hard time. And so this is true for, for all techniques. And then our technique, as I explained here, once, once we make it tractable, we lose optimality. So that means there's some, there's some problems in there where it, it will not work well on, right? Um, and, and then our solution was really to combine with, um, well, in, in fact, once, once we lose optimality here, I should also say that we, we lose completeness, right? Like we don't have a way of telling that something is really unsatisfiable. Um, but then when we combine it with a complete solver, like a CDCL solver, then we essentially let it um, uh, work on, on, on finalizing essentially the, the assignment, otherwise proving that uh, it's, it's unsatisfiable. And, and, and that works well. So I guess the, the merger of the two uh, was, was a good improvement. Yeah, I was kind of wondering if you could also just train it to recognize unsatisfiable instances. <laughs> so yeah, and unfortunately we can't do this because what it does is that it, it um, returns what it thinks are the variables that would have the highest probability of satisfying all clauses, right? And, and then if those variables don't satisfy all clauses, then the problem is you don't know if there are others that might. So that's why in that sense, it's, a, it's an incomplete solver. And in fact, most machine learning techniques tend to be 
uh, incomplete solvers when it comes to SAT because they're usually um, uh, optimizing things on, on a best effort basis, but they're not uh, they're not comprehensive or they, they won't uh, look at all possibilities. So they can't usually give a proof of, of unsatisfiability. So like, I, I guess to this day, the, the proofs of unsatisfiability essentially require some form of extensive search. And, and that's what the CDCL solvers do uh, efficiently, right? So, so they, they essentially do a, uh, a, a complete search. All right, we've maybe got, uh, we're almost out of time. So if you have any questions for Pascal, yell them out in the next five seconds. Okay, can we turn on our cameras and then just do a virtual clap to thank Pascal for giving the talk? All right, thank you. Uh, in, enjoy your uh, cold, cold winter in Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you for joining us, Pascal. Bye, Thanks for hosting, Mark. <laughs>